Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, a mother was up early one morning, getting ready, getting ready for work, you know, and as she was about to, to head out the door to start her day, she decided to check on her 13-year-old daughter to see if her daughter was up and ready for school before she went. But when she went to check on her daughter, the door was locked. This immediately to the mother was, uh, well, worrying, and so she started trying to bust her way in, because the door was never locked. When she got in, the room was empty and the window was wide open. Little did anyone know that her daughter had been talking online to a Dr. Tombstone, and Dr. Tombstone was not alone. Before we get into this old video, please click that little old subscribe button to see new videos every single week. Now, let's give it a go. So this old story takes place in Blacksburg, Montgomery County, Virginia. Population a little under 55,000. One of the more notable places near here is Virginia Tech University, which, uh, well, it, it's pretty famous for something you don't want to be famous for. Overall, though, it's a nice little place in a nice little part of the country. Blacksburg is dominated by Virginia Tech. Essentially, it's a college town and ranked, wait for it, as one of the best college towns for brain games. Give me some of that brain gain, y'all. If you want to learn a little something, something about tech, it's off to VT for you. Virginia Tech, I'm awaiting my check. Pretty cool place. But it certainly was not. Right, on the morning of January 27th, 2016. My friends. That was when Tammy Weeks went into her 13-year-old daughter's bedroom to check on her before she left for work. Something she did every morning. Typically, a reassuring sleepy Nicole would be in her bed. However, on this morning, Tammy struggled to open her daughter's door. They didn't have locks on their bedroom doors, so Tammy immediately went into mama bear mode and shoved as hard as she could, only to find that Nicole's bedside table, that had been pushed up against the door. Nicole's window was also left wide ass open. Her phone and a minion blanket were also missing. Not only was this incredibly worrisome and, and a frightening sight for any parent to see, what was even equally as worried is that Nicole, as an infant, she'd had a liver transplant, so she needed to take medication twice, two times a day. Her medication was still in her bedroom. Nicole Lovell was born May 3rd, 2002 in Radford City, Virginia, to Tammy and David. She was lovingly referred to as Coley by all those who knew her. Nicole's parents were never married, and her father left her mother just weeks before her birth. Nicole was born with a damaged liver and underwent a liver transplant at the tender age of only 10 months. That's why she needed her medication. Anti-rejection drugs she needed to take twice a day. Now, Nicole was a happy, cheerful young girl, but her mother would also say she was bullied in school. The scars visible from her many surgeries, uh, you know, kind of left her open to attack by those real, you know, little shitty kids that we all love to hate. Kids suck. Like many who, you know, struggle with it with acceptance, though many teens, Nicole, you know, not finding it difficult in the real world with her school friends, not that she had any, she turned to the internet, you know, to make friends there. And friends, she did. Specifically, she went onto an app called Kick Messenger app. The Kick Messenger app was known for helping users stay anonymous. No valid email or phone number was required to sign up. They also made a public statement that targeting younger users was one of their business goals. You can probably guess what happened next when you're targeting kids. Other people who also like to target kids kind of uh, dove right in. See, Kick was, is still used as, you know, a vehicle for a lot of nefarious acts, uh, sex trafficking. Uh, people who, you know, like them young would also be in there. In, in 2016, uh, one freaking sex offender was was caught and there was all these there was like 200 groups of these little sex offender rings operating on kick the goods and bads of privacy are like right there on display one hand well hey nobody wants to be tracked so that's great on the other hand you know people who maybe should be tracked like child predators they can kind of operate with impunity it's like one of them swords with the two edges or something anyways the night before she disappeared tammy said it was like any other night nicole kissed her good night went into her own room one regret Tammy had, though, was that usually just before she went to sleep, she would knock on Nicole's wall, you know, uh, to let her know that if Nicole wanted to get into bed with her mother, that was okay. That night she didn't. 
for some reason she just decided against it and something kind of, she kind of regretted ever since. Now Tammy was left with an empty bedroom, an open window, and a 13-year-old girl missing. When she called the police at 7.15 a.m., they immediately went into action. Simply because, well, I mean, a missing child is always horrifying, but also she need, she was in dire need of her medication. Time was a ticking. Police are searching for a missing girl they say is in danger. 13-year-old Nicole Lovell was last seen at her family's Blacksburg apartment about midnight last night. When her mother went to wake her up this morning, she was gone. We spoke to Nicole's mother and uncle today. They say their girl who goes by Coley has always been happy. They say she loves to sing and to dance and has always wanted to be a contestant on American Idol. Her mom, Tammy Weeks, clutched Nicole's favorite stuffed panda bear as she pleaded with her daughter to come home or that whoever is with her would bring her back safely. Investigators pursued every lead, and when Nicole's friends mentioned she'd been talking online with an older boy and referred to him as her boyfriend, Nicole's mother was disturbed and shocked. While searching Nicole's room for leads, investigators found a piece of paper taped on the wall in her closet. It was the usernames and passwords, if you can believe it, of all her online accounts. So then, police contacted Kick to release whatever user information of anyone Nicole had been in contact with. And Kick came true, fair play to him, and police noticed the last communication with Nicole before she disappeared was the username Dr. Underscore Tombstone. Well, on January 30th, three days after Nicole vanished, Dr. Underscore Tombstone was brought in for questioning. They were able to trace him via the IP address he used to log into his Kick account. Dr. Tombstone, aka 18 year old Virginia Tech student, David. Eisenhower. David was a freshman at the university, taking engineering. He was a tall, lanky kid, a little bit awkward, but he was also star track and field runner on his high school team. We went the distance to tell you about one of the greatest distance <laughs> runners this state has, and his name is David Eisenhower. I make my personal goals achievable, like, or just out of reach of achievable. That way I'm always constantly striving to better myself. If that goal becomes a record, or if that goal is past a record, or records get broken in the process, I consider that, like, a milestone goal, but that's not where I ultimately want to end up. At the station, now David did admit he'd been talking to Nicole about a month before, and he basically said he'd been talking to someone who's five years younger than him you know, when he's 18 years old, is that essentially he was bored, he was just like, you know, just bored, started randomly chatting to anybody he could. He also said that Nicole at the time told him she was like 16, 17. I'd like, I'd just like to help. <clears throat> Mid-December, correctly, I was bored in my dorm room and logged on to a website where you go and you just talk to random strangers. It's an anonymous kind of, the website is called Omegle, if I believe correctly. Okay. And she's like, hey, do you want to use my, or like, message me on some app called Kick? And I was like, sure. What? We're talking. And she's like, yeah, I'm 16 or 17. I do not remember the age, she said. They spoke daily until David admitted they had arranged a meetup on the night of January 26th, interesting date, and he had driven to her place to pick her up. However, when he pulled up, he told police that he saw she was much younger than she had previously stated, so he left immediately. Headed back to campus to hang out with a friend. He said he didn't even get out of the car. I get there, and then I see someone who probably looked like she was 11 years old climb out of a window, and I was like, oh, uh, 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 not for me. This young lady's never been hurt by me. Okay. So it's not going to be possible for us to believe that it's not. Okay, thank you. I do not know where she is. This is utter bullshit, obviously. So the police immediately put the, put the bracelets on him, arrested him for the abduction of Nicole Lovell. I think the police should look more into finding a body and try to interrogate the last person who saw her alive, who clearly left the scene. Oh. Guys, now I stand up and put your hands behind your back. You are under arrest for the abduction of Nicole Madison Lovell. Officers say that the new developments in the investigation led them to Eisenhower. With this arrest, investigators are very much in the midst of what is a rapidly developing investigation. In David's dorm room, police found a piece of paper with Nicole's address on it. They also tracked down his friend from campus that David admitted to going to see after leaving Nicole. 
This friend was a fellow student named Natalie Keepers. More like Natalie Leavers, who don't tell me what's gonna happen. This girl is batshit, let me tell you. She couldn't even keep her own head straight while flip-flopping. You know, call her a fish, because she's flip-flopping. Police got permission from Natalie herself to go through her phone. She probably would have wished she hadn't done that. And Natalie admitted, yeah, David had gone to her after being distraught after meeting him with Nicole. However, on her phone, police found, you know, extremely disturbing messages between Natalie and David. These best buddies, you know, the gruesome twosome. Natalie had texted David saying, I smell like cleaning supplies and I've been around a lot of blood. There, there's more, but you know, we get the idea. Wow, I wonder what that could mean. We know that you have information about this. What do you think they're pulling out of your phone? Yeah. When confronted, Natalie said, yeah, you're right. Nicole is dead. Natalie, how much are you involved? We'll see you. Working to to help him over life. She swore up and down that she wasn't involved in the actual killing and wasn't even there to witness it, but did say that David forced her to move Nicole's body. When speculating about a motive, Natalie said she, you know, thought that David was worried he might have gotten Nicole pregnant. Yikes. Major. Big yuck. That's big yikes. She was more like, what if I slept with her and what if she ends up pregnant? He stabbed her. He killed her. And not... In the woods, the next day, he told me that he needed help. Nicole's body was found on January 31st, down a ditch off Craig Creek Road, which was not too far from the university. She had been stabbed 14 times with a lethal stab to her neck. When confronted, David said he had no part in her murder. He stuck by the story that he left Nicole at her house that night and was with Natalie the rest of the night. No idea how she ended up there. Police, they went balls to the wall with this investigation. They got the surveillance footage, they got the phone records, got the GPS that was in David's car. David was too stupid to even realize his car had a GPS and could be tracked where he had driven that very night, maybe to Craig Creek Road. Two Virginia Tech students are now in custody in connection to the death of Nicole Lovell. Today, Blacksburg police announced the arrest of Natalie Keepers. The 19-year-old faces one felony count of improper disposal of a dead body and one misdemeanor count of accessory after the fact. Now, Keepers' arrest comes in addition to the arrest of David Eisenhower. So when police searched his car, they found not only that GPS, but they found blood. A shovel. Blood on the shovel. Blood in the trunk. Upon looking at the data from the GPS, it showed David at Nicole's place, at the scene of the crime off Craig Creek Road, and at a Walmart. With this information, they got surveillance footage from Walmart. But wouldn't you know it, there was David and Natalie on January 26th, around 4pm, buying a shovel, cleaning supplies, wipes and gloves. So yeah, January 26th, this is all prior to Nicole's disappearance. Not suspicious at all. They were also seen at a fast food joint before the killing. The text messages matched up. It looked as though Natalie and David had hatched this plan together as early as the start of January. They'd gone through various ways to kill Nicole, and had even considered swapping her medication for cyanide pills. David's computer use showed he googled things like, how long does it take to burn a body? And how did Dexter get rid of his bodies? Based on evidence collected to date, we have determined that Eisenhower and Nicole were acquainted prior to their, her disappearance. Eisenhower used this relationship to his advantage to abduct and then kill her. These details have come to light following a four-day search pursuing hundreds of phoned-in tips and social media leads with ground teams and even aerial drones provided by Virginia Tech. Police say the investigation is far from over. It is also discovered that David and Nicole had met up once previously to the murder. In text messages, he was texting Nicole, threatening her, basically saying, you know, if she was to tell anybody about their relationship, he would do bad things. When police searched Natalie's dorm room, they found a gym bag. Inside the gym bag was another bag. Inside that bag was the minion's blanket missing from Nicole's. Missing from Nicole's bedroom. The events as told by Natalie is probably as close as we will ever get to the real truth here, because uh, David has never, never said anything about what actually happened that night. 
It's believed that David and Natalie went to Walmart after dinner to buy the supplies. Natalie then says she was dropped off at a dorm while David went to Nicole's. He picked her up around midnight, drove to Craig Creek Road, took her there for what, you know, they would say was a romantic little getaway between an 18 year old and a 13 year old. My God. Then he murdered her instead. Put her in the trunk of his car, drove them back to the university, met with Natalie, picked her up. Then the pair of them drove back to Craig Creek Road, which doesn't make any sense at all. This is, again, Natalie's version, kind of, of events. His GPS does not show that, though I'm pretty sure Natalie would have been there the entire time, participating in the actual murder, not just helping cover it up like she says. In the investigation, police also recovered text messages David sent to an unknown person who's, who's never really been identified, saying, the text message reads something along the lines of, original plan failed. What the plan was, what the information, who this guy was, nobody nobody really knows. The only information is that he's a Pulaski man. Pulaski is like the next town over from Blacksburg. In Natalie's interrogation with the police, she maintained she did not take part in the actual murder, but only helped dispose and clean up the body and the aftermath. She confided she did not believe that David was going to go through with it. Otherwise, she said she would have stopped it. But she also said that David's involving made her feel special and part of a special little club. He loved the fact that we were working together and it made me feel loved and it made me feel special. He made me feel like I was being a part of some like a secret club that like only me and him were a part of and it was the best club in the world. I guess we have completely different ide ideas of what special clubs would try. Try the chess club next time, I mean, come on! Anywho, she also said David brought out, you know, this, ooh, dark, dark and twisted side to her, the psychotic side of her. I don't think she needs any help with that. Natalie Keepers would later call herself a sociopath in training, though, let's be honest here, Natalie, you're being kind of modest here. Both were charged and awaiting their own trials. Natalie, poor girl, she complained at her own bail hearing that the food in the jail, it wasn't, uh, you know, she she couldn't handle it because she had celiac disease. She couldn't handle the gluten. Nah, some people go through a real hard time. What we know about Natalie is, again, she's not someone, you know, you would likely suspect in such a violent crime. She was born into a very straight-laced Christian family with twin brothers, her mother and her father, her mother an x-ray technician, her father an aerospace engineer with NASA. Natalie Keepers, like David Eisenhower, a native of Maryland. In fact, they only grew up 13 miles from each other. Natalie in Laurel, David in Columbia. That's likely how they became friends in Virginia Tech. She was in the top 15% of her class, an engineering student at Virginia Tech with aspirations to follow in her father's footsteps, who, again, worked at NASA. She performed in a number of musical theater plays at her high school, part of the editorial team as well, but she also had a history of mental health issues and was on a daily dosage of Prozac. Her trouble with mental health started as early as eighth grade with, with bullying, she would say. Then she started to self-harm. While in prison, she was examined by multiple experts. She was actually diagnosed with six different mental disorders. Going for gold. Depersonalization, derealization disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, borderline personality disorder, dependent and schizotypal disorder, panic disorder, persistent depressive disorder. David, on the other hand, straight, straight-laced. Never would have suspected it. Good student, star, star athlete, as you can see in the interview. Turns out, though, he was a real weirdo. Weird, weird to the O. Classmates reported, you know, he all star track and field that lead, straight-A student. One person classified him as a bit cocky. I will personally not stop until I reach my peak performance which could be anywhere. Boo, you suck. The entire reasoning behind the murder is still vague at best. The prosecution would say, right, that David's motive was the exposure of his relationship with Nicole. Whether he knew she was of age before or after, hey, listen, nobody really knows. Regardless, David, dude, you suck so much. She's clearly a child. And I think he might just be a, wait for it, child predator but he was worried their relationship might be exposed and that he was worried she may be pregnant, which she was not at the time of her death. Natalie's reasoning and why she involved herself in this and why she wanted to be involved in this because it was something they'd been planning for about a month. Well, Natalie Keepers simply had an urge to kill. Of course, uh, both simply blamed the other, saying that she had been manipulated again, lads. 
On day four of his trial, David changed his plea from not guilty to no contest. I guess he figured he was so well and truly up shit creek with all they had in him. He wouldn't have an arse in his trousers after the prosecution finished their case, so he decided to tap out. I could make a prison joke there, but I, I, I probably shouldn't. When he returned, we saw him visibly emotional. For the first time in the case, he stared down to the floor, not making eye contact with anyone for several minutes. That means he, he wouldn't admit anything, but couldn't argue the evidence against him. That also means he waived his right to appeal. I am sorry for the pain that my actions have caused Nicole Lovell and her family. It is my deepest regret, and I'm aware my actions have serious consequences. Nothing can ever undo what has been done, and for that, I am deeply, sincerely, and forever sorry. Family members of Nicole Lovell spoke about how hard her loss has been for them. Her mother, Tammy Weeks Dowdy, says everything she sees reminds her of her daughter. I go to bed at night hoping everything was a nightmare. Outside the courthouse, she told 10 News that today did not give her closure. I'm just numb right now. It's not real. Nicole's father, David, says he now has PTSD and struggles with depression. It's just a horrible crime on her. It's a shame. And it there's nothing that can happen in this courtroom that will ever fix it. Experts for the defense also said David was on the spectrum, which allowed him to be manipulated and coerced more easily by Natalie Keepers. Mental health professionals testified that Natalie Keepers, who awaits a trial for being an accessory in this case, orchestrated the crimes, and Eisenhower would not have wanted to kill Lovell without her influence. I think she was the mastermind. I think she is the driver of the process. I think she has found somebody that she can manipulate. The sentencing for Eisenhower was carried out on June 2018, where he was sentenced to 50 years in prison, plus another 25 to be served on probation for first degree murder, abduction, and concealing a dead body. Judge, her actions in this case show that her release constitutes a danger to the public. And we would submit that she has earned her 45 year sentence, Judge. Natalie's trial was shortly after where she was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years for accessory before and after the fact and concealing a body. After 40 years, she'd be placed on a 10 year probation. I'm proud for your family every day. I'm so sorry. I wish I could have stopped. <laughs> What a drama queen. In December 2020, Natalie Keeper's appeal for a retrial was denied. Thankfully. Since Nicole's murder, her family's worked hard to help raise awareness to parents, you know, about social media and internet use for kids and teens alike. Gone, sort of, like the days of, you know, kids being snatched off playgrounds. Now it's like, internet. Internet kind of stuff. You know, shenanigans. No good people on there. I always say that. No, the internet is any good. All... Except me. I'm alright. Yeah, sort of. Thank you so much for watching. It uh, really means the world to me. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed this whole video. And the next video will be up in a couple of days. So please give it a go when that's out. But you know what? Until the next one, please take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out.